Hello and welcome to today's webinar with Spin in the Tea. Everything you need to know about the updated Department of Justice guidance on corporate compliance programs. Um, we'll just wait for a few more people to join before we kick off. So if you do have any questions um, for today's session, feel free to pop them in the Q&A box below and we'll get through them uh, towards the end of the session. So thank you. Okay, so before we start um, today's session, I'm just going to run through the general housekeeping. So firstly, please note um, all the participants all um, will have their speakers muted. And as I mentioned, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them below in the question box or any comments and we will um, get through them at the end of the session. And just also to let you know, finally, um, the recording from today will be shared with you via email tomorrow afternoon so you can watch it on demand. Um, so we'll just move on to a little bit of information about Applause Match in case you haven't heard of us. So we are an award-winning regulatory technology company that helps companies automate their compliance processes. We support organizations from across the board such as large enterprises like Barclays, BlackRock, to fintechs and smaller organizations such as Pension B and Griffin. We do have offices across the globe from the US to the UK, Singapore, Portugal, and we support clients from over 65 countries. That is just a little bit about us. Um, and without much further ado, do, I'm going to introduce you to today's moderator, Justin Jawa, an account executive here at Clause Match and GRC expert, analyst, and pundit, Michael Rasmussen. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Emma, for the introduction. Michael, hello. Good morning. Officially, good morning. Uh, we're, we're both in the same time zone. So good morning to you. You're not over in, in uh, the UK or in London uh, or, or anywhere else that you're gallivanting around. So it's nice to have you uh, nearby. Um, so good to, good to see you. Good to speak to you. Um, there's obviously a lot of very interesting things to chat through with the new DOJ guidance. I have quite a few questions for you. Wanted to get your take on for everybody here uh, and for everybody else who's viewing pleasure. Nice, uh, nice to have you here. We're excited to share this information with you. Um, and we hope that you find it, uh, fun, enjoyable and, uh, educational. So, um, uh, Michael, well, you know, I was kind of reviewing the the guidance there. I know you you have a lot more expertise on things that have changed. Well, one of the first things I was curious about finding out from you is um, uh, how the recent uh, guidance on corporate compliance programs may have changed since the last update came out in 2020. Um, what what have you have you seen has been the trajectory of these guidances over the past decade or so? Oh gosh, uh, I mean it, it, it goes back actually decades, or you could even say 150 years. Uh, I mean. Going back to 1973, we are in 2023, so that would be 150 years ago. You had, you know, all the issues after the the Civil War and the railways, and, and a lot of uh, corporate wrongdoing in that context, and, and big collapse. Uh, gosh, um, that thinking back that far, uh, you know, after the Civil War, that would have been, um, uh, I think it was the the Cook, uh, if I remember right, but. But it, but in a lot in, of themes that started the mail fraud statutes. But then 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 you had a, you know a lot through the the Roosevelt administration and then into the depression with Franklin Roosevelt. Oh well, Teddy Roosevelt originally, and uh, but but then also Franklin Roosevelt in uh, you know around 1930 with the depression and and all the the wrongdoing there. But then uh, <laughs> the modern compliance program, and, and I'm going back a little bit further than than what you were stating. I, I mean, really. The modern compliance program really started to redefine itself uh, going back to 1977, particularly with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FCPA, and the ongoing and evolution of enforcement there. And, and of course, that's not the only thing we have antitrust and, and, and so much more that plays into that. Um, but, you know, with, uh, with increasing enforcement on corporations and, and, and greater scrutiny compliance programs, 
back in 1991, you had uh, the Federal Sensing Commission released its first version of the organizational sensing guidelines uh, that looked at the, you know, the what are the what are the effective components and elements of a compliance program uh, within an organization, and those can be used to mitigate um, uh, uh, fines and penalties. And so uh, well, we're going to talk about the Department of Justice side right now, and and with the Department of Justice evaluation of compliance programs, that side of it is: do we prosecute a company? You know, and 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 how deeply do we prosecute them and go after them uh, based on their compliance program and how the, the, their structure and their culture? On the flip side, if you are being prosecuted, you have the U.S. Federal Sentencing Commission organizational sensing practices and what we commonly call the seven elements of an effective compliance program. And I wrote a paper, gosh, 15, 20 years ago on seven habits of highly effective compliance programs, sort of taking a play on Steve Covey. And there's an eighth habit too. I mean, there's an eighth element about compliance risk assessments. So on one side, you have you know, what's needed for a successful compliance program so we avoid prosecution or, or uh, mitigate our exposure to prosecution. But on the other side, with the U.S. federal sensing guidelines, we have a good compliance program that if we are prosecuted, how do we minimize our fines and, and penalties? Uh, and, and so the, the U.S. federal sensing guidelines has evolved over the years as well. But it was specifically to the DOJ guidance, the Department of Justice. I mean, this go, goes back over 20 years to what originally was the Thompson memo and then became uh, the McNulty mem memorandum uh, in, in defining that and, and evolved. And in some of the specific things, these original memorandums that became uh, a central piece of the evaluation compliance programs, you know, going back to, the, to some of the original pieces is looking at the nature and seriousness of the offense, including the risk of harm to the public and, the, and applicable policies and priorities uh, if they're there, governing the prosecution of corporations, uh, the pervasiveness of wrongdoing within the corporation was evaluated, including complicity of management, uh, the corporation's history of similar conduct, the corporation's timely and voluntary disclosure of wrongdoing, and its willingness to cooperate, which we still even see in this current memo, we see all these things reflected, the existence and adequacy of the corporation's pre-existing compliance program, remedial actions, collateral consequences, uh, the adequacy of the prosecution of individuals and other remedies. And so the, the, what was the Thompson memo, then the McNulty memo, uh, combined with other factors from the SEC and things all sort of rolled in to what we have as the evaluation compliance program, which uh, is updated every few years. Um, and, and just to pr provide a baseline primer on that, uh, going back for the last several years, some key fundamental pieces is that the U.S. Department of Justice asked three fundamental questions. Uh, the first question, is the corporation's compliance program well designed? So does do we have a good compliance program on paper, let's say? Is it designed properly from compliance risk assessments to well-written policies and procedures to training, communications, and engagement to confidential, confidential reporting structures and investigation process to managing compliance across third-party relationships as well as compliance in mergers and acquisitions? So that was the first question covering those areas. Is the corporation's compliance program well-designed? The second question, is the program well applied earnestly and in good faith? In other words, is the program adequately resourced and empowered to function effectively? You can have a great compliance program by design, but the second question is, uh, you know, uh, is, it, is it actually being applied? Uh, is there commitment by senior executives and middle management? Uh, does compliance have its own autonomy and resources? And over the last a uh, few decades because of uh, both the U.S. federal sensing guidelines, but also uh, the Department of Justice uh, requirements here, well, evaluation compliance programs, I shouldn't say requirements because uh, it's guidance, uh, but you, and, and the resulting non-prosecution agreements and uh, deferred prosecution agreements and corporate integrity agreements and so forth, you know, you're seeing a big push where compliance comes outside of legal to be its own entity. Uh, because legal and it has a duty to, dis and I'm speaking gen generally here, uh, but le legal has a duty to deny and protect, while compliance has a duty to discover and fix, and these can be at odds with each other. So you're seeing a lot of compliance and ethics programs that are being uh, implemented specifically within, uh, you know, out out outside of legal and things. In fact, one large consumer packaged goods firms has legal compliance under legal to interpret laws and regulations and apply to their context, but operational compliance where the chief ethics and compliance officer sits, sits outside. So that autonomy is there. So I, I looked at the question, is the corporation's compliance program well-designed? 
is the program being applied earnestly and in good faith? The third question is, does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? So it's just continuous improvement, investigations are being done, and analysis and analysis remediation of underlying misconduct so you're not a repeat offender. You know, and, and so the, that, that's the core of it. And that core structure has, still remains the same. And, and a lot of it mirrors, you know, the, the United States Sentencing Commission organizational sentencing practices. The, the, the seven elements there are the oversight and accountability and resources, standards and controls, which really are policies and procedures and controls, effective training, communication, you know, engagement, evaluation, monitoring and auditing and compliance, enforcement and discipline and incentives and due care and delegating authorities, making sure you're not giving access to individuals to processes and money and so forth that have a bent towards criminal behavior and response and continuous improvement. So both the USSC organizational sentencing practices and the DOGA evaluation compliance programs really work hand in hand. They come at two different sides of the story. Uh, uh, um, one uh, to avoid prosecution or minimize prosecution, the other as a result of prosecution, determining fines and penalties and, 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 and the, uh, the, the different factors that weigh into that. Um, so, I mean, I, I just unpacked a lot there sort of going through some of the history but <laughs> your question itself was specifically on what stood out and surprised me. Well, in the previous version, going back to June of 2020 was the last update before the March 2023 update. Um, there was a lot of focus on the third party aspect, but also on the policies and procedures, you know, that portal being able to uh, understand who accessed the policies, who was reminded of the policies, and having that audit trail, what was a key thing that stood out to me in the previous update. Uh, in this current update, uh, you're seeing a lot of things from uh, the the Monaco memorandum in which where there's greater accountability focus uh, on executives and things. And so uh, you're seeing a lot of particular focus on greater accountability with transparent communication regarding disciplinary processes and actions, tracking data on disciplinary actions to monitor the effectiveness of the compliance program, which you can't do that in documents, spreadsheets, and emails, tracking investigations and incidents and disciplinary actions. You're going to have to have some type of defined audit trail of who did what, when, how, and why, and documents, spreadsheets, and emails don't get you that. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the overall uh, compensation structure and claw clawbacks you know, where they want to look at the incentivized compliance to make sure that corporations incentivize compliance by designing compensation systems that defer or escrow certain compensation tied to conduct standards. Uh, there's an attempt to recoup compensation previously awarded to individuals who are responsible for corporate wrongdoing. And, and uh, the focus on uh, uh, w ensuring that compliance is in, pro in, in place and working uh, and, and that people are adhering to compliance as a means of career advancement, uh, that, you know, that there's offer, offering opportunities in compliance related roles or setting compliance as a significant metric for management bonuses. Um, it, that's some of the things that they want to look at there. Uh, so we see a lot of uh, focus on that area, uh, which requires mandatory compliance related compensation criteria for corporate criminal matters and deferred re reduction of criminal fines. Uh, but, but you know, going into some of the weeds of stuff, you're seeing a lot of focus on the use of personal devices, communications, platforms, and messaging applications. Uh, and and, and the, the, this, uh, I, I understand the points here, but it took me a little bit by surprise because this is getting into a lot of the weeds, the nitty gritty piece. I mean, they're getting into a lot of the depths of, you know, uh, how our organizations allowing the use of personal devices and what's kept on there uh, and, and communications and communication platforms like instant messaging and things like that all comes into more focus and getting a little bit more down in the weeds on that. And of course, they also updated guidance on corporate monitored ships and making sure that those are in there and voluntary self-disclosure. Uh, and, and so th there's a lot of things that they point out here in this one that reinforces that. I mean, to me, uh, obviously getting some of the weeds of the uh, communication channels and, and personal devices and messaging, uh, th that's a significant thing. But the thing that really stands out to me is a lot of the accountability aspects and, and particularly related to compensation. And, and you're seeing other aspects of this around the world, like with the accountability regimes uh, in the UK, Ireland, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Africa, Australia. Um, uh, but they're, they're not the same as what the US Department of Justice is putting in place here. But there's definitely a relationship of a, uh, of a similar type 
nothing, uh, but, but not, certainly not the same for what we see in accountability regimes around the world. But what we can see is a greater uh, ongoing thread of accountability. And I'm so I, I went into a whole diatribe there. I'll pause there to see what your next question is. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate all the information and insight. Um, yeah, some of the things that I noticed from reading through it and just dealing with some of my own uh, organizations that I've been dealing with here, I've had an example of uh, an organization here in Chicago that actually was having difficulties with um, uh, personal devices and external communication. Um, and they had to, you know, end up going through a, a long remediation process uh, uh, and a whole testing regimen because of the new guidance that's coming out. And that's, that's something that a lot of organizations are having to deal with. And then on top of that, again, <laughs> part of um, why they were looking at, uh, at us as a potential solution was because of the liability, personal liability aspect as well from chief compliance officers and leadership. And I believe um, some of the statements coming out from the DOJ were saying that that leadership should be uh, very involved in the compliance program um, and, and be on top of this, particularly when it pertains to these types of uh, guidances that are coming out in the new in the in the new guidance here. So uh, what I'm curious to know from you um, now is, um, you know, what what kind of changes to the compliance uh, program should compliance teams be thinking about to tackle some of these these updates, particularly around the communication changes and personal liability? What kind of policies procedures do you do you see that they should probably uh, start updating or implementing in regards to tackling these in the new guidance? Well, there, there, there's certainly a range of them. And, and so at the heart of it, there's a cultural culture challenge. Uh, there's greater accountability for compliance with executives and management. And, and so uh, in that context, organizations want to clearly under, uh, communicate their policies uh, around compliance and engagement. And, and any policy related to the, to the ethical and, and compliance culture of the organization needs to be communicated and enhanced from the code of conduct uh, on down. Uh, because at, at the heart of that whole accountability, it, it's getting to the actual culture, the management culture and leadership, but how that permeates throughout the organization for the broader ethical and compliance culture of the organization. And, and so th to me, that, that applies to a wide range of policies and procedures related to misconduct, because you know, that, that accountability uh, rolls up to executives and management for uh, compliance. Uh, and, and so it's a governance type aspect that drills down into nitty gritty. Obviously, on some of the more specifics, I mean, organizations should definitely review their policies related to bring your own devices, you know, from laptops to cell phones, to tablets, um, as well as the use of uh, messaging applications, the appropriate use of messaging applications, when and how, uh, and, and the audit trails that are needed there when they're used. I mean, so th th those are some of the policies that specifically come to mind. Uh, but it's also important to note that um, while there's changes uh, to this, all the remaining aspects from the previous uh, piece are still there. And, and so having that good policy portal, making sure that uh, you're managing compliance across third party relationships, uh, you know, our eyes don't come off the, uh, the portions that were already there. They might have added new things that we need to consider. But all the other pieces that are part of the evaluation compliance programs are still critically important. It's not that we ignore those and neglect those and move on to this. No, the, the whole scope of it needs to be kept in, in play. Yeah, that's that's what I've been hearing as well from some of the folks that I've been speaking to. Like all, all of it needs to be taken into context. But one thing that I was a big component of, of this as well was, and one thing that I noticed quite a bit in the document, I'm not sure if it's 100% different than before, but you brought this up was the risk elements um, as well. There's a lot around the testing and man managing and mitigating risks as it pertains to these new guidances coming out. So I'm curious, what do you think these recent developments will, will impact organizations from a risk standpoint? How do organizations, uh, what should organizations be looking to do to, to implement um, uh, things to mitigate that risk? Well, they should clearly uh, define and document their compliance risks out there, whether it's uh, conduct risks uh, to, uh, you know, from fraud and things like that, to um, uh, uh, risks around Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FCPA, to antitrust, um, anything that falls under the scope of uh, DOJ prosecution. 
Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously, we won't even go beyond that because a, a compliance program isn't built specifically just for the DOJ, and, and it's about the, the ethical and compliance and regulatory obligations and legal obligations of the organization overall. Uh, and, and so that, that goes beyond DOJ because there's other aspects too to consider. But in the, in the context of the DOJ, of course, you want to review all the risks and document those for compliance and ethics in that area. Uh, and, and, and conduct a risk assessment because, you know, for some organizations, FCPA is not a big issue. For others, it's a huge issue, uh, depending on the size of the, uh, the organization. But even that's changed over the years with the with a lot of the um, SEC and DOJ enforcement. They're saying, we don't care if you're a small to mid-sized company, we're coming after you. Uh, and we've seen uh, cases like Smith & Wesson and Avon, which um, uh, really emphasize some of that point, those points. But then... Um, uh, but uh, where was I going to that? But uh, you, you, you want to make sure that you, you document your risks. And then the, uh, for me, it, a lot of it starts with policies and how do, how do our policies, what do they state, how we're addressing those risks uh, and, and, our, and how do those policies get defined in our corporate culture and engagement? Are those policies actually being followed? Uh, you may not think of it this way, but every policy is a risk document. There wouldn't be a policy if there wasn't a risk. The very fact that we mean the, the, the very fact that we have a policy means that we have a risk. We've identified that risk, and that risk was significant enough that we had to sit behind a word processor and write a document, or or sit behind clause match and, and write a document and call it a policy. Uh, uh, and, and so every policy is a risk document. So you want to understand your compliance risks. Start with your policies. Uh, and now you might be missing policies. So there might be compliance risks that you're missing, but but every policy itself is a risk document. There wouldn't be a policy if there wasn't a risk. So you want to identify your compliance risks out there um, and then assess the, you, your company culture in context of that risk, you know, uh, and, and uh, history as well as the, the current environment. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with that. When I, <laughs> and I keep hate, hating bring up personal experiences, but that's what I got to work with. And <laughs> a lot of the organizations I'm working with, um, in a lot of cases, they don't have policies right now involved that a few of the organizations I was mentioning before, uh, particularly around the communication ex of external devices, um, having to do those testing programs, they, those are things that are new that people are needing to write um, information around. And it can't necessarily just be a cookie cutter uh, policy that you write or procedures in place, it really needs to be tailored. This is something I've, I've noticed, uh, reading a little bit of the guidance and just hearing from other compliance professionals as well. Um, one, one thing before, uh, kind of some of the final questions here, Michael, I, I want to get back to kind of the personal liability aspect, because again, in my experience, <laughs> I think maybe a lot of compliance people will be able to relate to this, um, uh, uh getting leadership to be involved from an executive level committee can be difficult. Um, unless the, it's kind of like the, uh, the meme of the dog in in the room what's on fire saying everything's fine everybody can relate to that uh, seems to be that that tends to be the case when everything's on fire leadership tends to get involved uh, and they go oh shoot we need to make some changes here um, but really you know what this guidance is coming out with and what a lot of everybody who's watching compliance professionals know is you're gonna have to you, you want to make sure you have the hose ready to put out the fire before the fires even start um, I think that's what some of this guidance is so when getting back to like the personal liability and risk aspects from a leadership perspective. Again, I reference um, uh, the DOJ leadership coming out saying leadership needs to take an effective role. So what are your recommendations for the compliance professionals watching here today on the webinar? How do they get their leadership? And not just, I'm not just saying CCOs, but this is also other C-levels involved um, when either looking for bringing in tech to deal with it or just getting involved in the process now as it looks like it's going to have to after the collapse of SVB, the Fed saying, oh, we screwed up, more guidance is coming out, leadership needs to be, leadership is being held accountable. Um, what is the message um, compliance professionals listening here today should be bringing to their leadership on dealing with this guidance and saying, hey, we really need to get onto this? What would you recommend for those? Well, the key questions? message is, is that compliance doesn't happen in the back office of compliance. Compliance happens in the business. From the decisions that board and executives make to middle operational management to frontline employees, compliance happens all throughout the organization. And it needs to be clearly understood that there's greater accountability on executives and the board for compliance that filters down all the way to that, that employee on, on, the, on the edge of the organization, whether it's a teller at a bank or a doctor or nurse at a hospital, you, you name it. Uh, compliance rolls up to these senior management functions and accountability. 
and, and, and we're seeing this very well defined, like in the United Kingdom with the SMCR, Senior Managers and Certification Regime, where you have to have 28 senior management functions that are mapped to specific areas of risk and compliance. And if there's corporate wrongdoing, uh, willful misconduct, that senior management function go to jail. If there's lack of due diligence or negligence, that senior management function can be fined out of their bank account, not the banks. And um, we just had a recent enforcement action in um, uh, uh, by the Prudential Regulatory Authority on a CIO, Chief Information Officer, uh, for failing to manage to the, the details in a third party relationship. It was fined around 100,000 uh, pounds personally. But uh, yeah, yeah, so we're seeing accountability around the world, but specifically in the DOJ piece you're, and, 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 and some of the more recent memorandums that we've had, we're seeing a huge focus on accountability for senior executives and management to ensure that compliance. Because again, a compliance doesn't happen in these back office functions of compliance. Compliance and ethics. Compliance and ethics is there to facilitate compliance, but compliance happens at all levels of the organization. So at the heart of it, it gets to that accountability structure of, of making sure executives and the board uh, understand that they own compliance, that it's part of their responsibility. And, and we've seen this in legal uh, legal decisions like the Caremark decision and 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 uh, Stone. Uh, oh gosh, um, Stone versus. Uh, Ritter, I think it was. I, I can't remember what the. the um, I used to know it by heart, but. Um, uh, time passes. Stone versus Ritter, I'm pretty sure it was, but, uh, but the Caremark decision and others. Uh, but the, but the, there's uh, fiduciary obligations of the board for compliance in, in those legal cases. Um, but the, the and so that that's the the clear thing is understanding your culture of compliance and engagement, and that the uh, board and senior management and all levels of operational management embrace that and understand their accountability and responsibilities in that area. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's a, that's a big message that we try and have conversations around with compliance professionals as well when evaluating things like tech on what to bring in to help with the, these compliance programs, building them out, GRCs, other tools like like us here at Clause Match, things like that. Um, you, you mentioned quite a bit, and I know you have a lot of expertise around the world as well. Uh, you've brought up the UK and other um, guidance coming through Europe. So I'm curious, uh, what you've noticed are some differences between what's going on in Europe, which in my estimation, what I've heard and what I've learned is in some cases a little bit stricter uh, than sometimes here in the US. Uh, US could be a little bit more like like the old days, like the wild, wild west, going back to the civil war uh, uh, that you're talking about earlier. Um, so it, it, do you find it it's it's with these guidances, it's still that way is is Europe and the UK um, is that something where the U.S. should find um, uh, more guidance from what they're doing? Or what are some of the major differences you're seeing between this guidance, what you've experienced in, in the U.K. and Europe, and what can we learn from that? There, there's so much uh, that, that differs between the, the, the two sides of the pond. Uh, in the U.K. and Europe, uh, in general, like on product liability and, and food safety and things like that and, and, and pharmaceuticals and things, uh, a, a lot of their regulation is prove that it is safe. While in the U.S., a lot of our legal and regulatory environment is prove that it's harmful. Uh, and and mm -hmm. so it sort of comes at it from different views. Uh, um, the, you had what was uh, called principles or outcome-based compliance, which started with the the FSA, the Financial Services Authority in the United Kingdom, then went over to the EU's better regulatory policy. Uh, and it, it really says we're not going to be prescriptive. The, the, in the U.S., we like uh, very much checklists. You know, tell me what I have to do. Give me my checklist for compliance. Let me check my check boxes. And if I check all my check boxes, I want my get out of jail free card. While a lot of the, the United Kingdom in Europe, it, it's outcome or principles based compliance. We're not going to tell you there are some areas where things are prescriptive, but in general, they're outcome or principles based where we're going to we're going to tell you what you have to achieve. The way you achieve it might be different from the way somebody else achieves it. We're going to measure you on the outcomes and the principles, uh, and it requires much more of a risk based approach to compliance and ethics. Uh, and, and, and so you, you have that perspective as well. Um, and, and, and that's one thing that really plays out differently between the two areas. Whereas, so in a lot of times in, in, in the United Kingdom and Europe, I find much more of a business risk-based approach and focus to compliance than I do in the U.S. Uh, the reality is, is we all have our issues. I mean, uh, Europe's approach, I, I tend to like more because it's more focused on objectives and outcomes. Uh, instead of like just checking check boxes, which can be more of a legalistic type perspective and looking for loopholes and things. 
Um, uh, if I check my checkbox, but you know, I, I here I did that, even though something bad still happened. It, 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 I think it, it, it's the wrong mindset in, in the U.S. Um, uh, but so in that context, uh, I think that the best compliance program is one built on objectives, and it moves beyond compliance to the ethics and values of the organization. And instead of checking check boxes, we define that objective out there. You know, well, we're uh, that objective can be related to you know we don't allow bribery and corruption within our business. Uh, that's an objective. We can have an objective of inclusivity and diversity and uh, objectives on on uh, conduct and, and all these different elements, um, as opposed to just checklists. Yeah, I I definitely can understand. <laughs> uh, again, a lot of people I work with it there's those conversations. Well, if I have this, this, and this, I should be okay. Nobody's come after me. I should be fine. Nobody, nobody's talked to me. It's like, okay, that's great. But what happens when somebody does come knocking on your door and you don't have the right things in place, you haven't thought through these things, what are you going to do then? And those are some of the hard conversations that uh, sometimes are not always thought about. But based on that experience that you have with Europe, I'm just curious, is there anything else uh, for people who are watching here, particularly in the US with this new DOJ guidance? Is there anything they can take advantage of from looking at what um, regulators and, and other organizations of Europe are doing? Some people here might be part of multinational organizations. Are there yeah. things that they should be gleaning from Europe, maybe implementing here to deal with the DOJ guidance that would help their compliance programs? I, you have to keep the full s scope and spectrum in line. I mean, just looking at the DOJ is one aspect because you also have to look at the U.S. Sensing Commission organizational sensing practices on the other side. But then you've got what are the regulars, regulators doing for their enforcement actions with whatever industry you're in. Then, particularly in the U.S., you've got civil liability. We're the number one litigious country in the world. We love our lawsuits. And so there's that end of it. And, and like Uber's chief information security officer was just held liable for security breach and things. This, this trend of accountability is growing. So you know, Department of Justice uh, Evaluation Compliance Program's guidance is critical and important, but it's one piece, a big piece, but it's one piece of a puzzle of uh, all these pressures upon organizations that we have to keep in line and align together to approach. And as you go international, you're dealing with the EU or specific country laws in the EU and the UK or an Asia PAC or wherever it might be. You've got our, even a broader scope and you need to make sure all these filter into what is going to be the right compliance and ethical program for your organization. Yeah, I, uh, again, that makes Total sense, but but looking at it from a holistic grand view, particularly if you're 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 watching and you're part of a, a multinational organization, I think the general uh, consensus would be take a look at what the rest of the world is doing and see how you can incorporate it, particularly with this new DOJ guidance that's coming out. So, Michael, a um, couple questions left here, uh, but one is I want you to take out your your crystal ball. And I want you to do some predictions for everybody. I'm curious um, what iterations or, or what changes uh, to the corporate compliance guidance do you potentially see uh, coming in the future? You mentioned on the, the past one, I think, which was in 2020, there's a lot on the focus on the audit trail, things like this. Um, obviously, now a lot on external communication, personal liability in this new iteration. It's kind of the, the foray. Do you if you were to look into your crystal ball, what do you see as what what should be coming down the pipe in the next iteration of this guidance? Or what should people be considering on top of all these other things they have to consider? We're going to have a greater and, and growing trend of good compliance documentation because bad things will happen in the organization, uh, you know, needs clear communications and documentation, audit trail system of record of its activities around policies and, and engagement and training and culture of the organization and assessments. I mean, that's just going to grow. Um, as we saw in the last update, you know, the third parties, that's going to continue to grow. And we're seeing continued risks in third party relationships. And, you know, and a good 90% or more of FCPA enforcement actions involved, involves a third party of some nature. Uh, and, and the modern organization is the extended enterprise of outsourcers, service providers, suppliers, vendors, contractors, consultants, brokers, agents, dealers, partners, intermediaries, and more. Uh, and their compliance issues are your compliance issues. And how do we deal with this in the extended enterprise? Um, uh, obviously, we're seeing a growing array of things on in, uh, import, export, and, and, and sanctions and things in the world right now with all the geopolitical risks. 
risk. Uh, but but the other big compliance trend that, that you know is concerning everybody is artificial intelligence and, and how is that going to be regulated? How do we use it? Uh, and what's the compliance risks in uh, of leveraging artificial intelligence uh, uh, for business purposes out there? And we've already seen a lot of issues that relate to HR and hiring and using AI technologies and 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 how it might be biased in areas of inclusivity and diversity and things. Uh, and, and so it's a very complicated world we live in and, and, and compliance is just becoming more and more challenging. Yeah, can't use chat GPT for everything, but uh, how to mitigate its its use is coming through. I think uh, I saw it was it came out a while ago that JP Morgan decided to stop their employees from using chat GPT for doing uh, part of their job. So um, yeah, I think that's that's true. AI is only uh, coming becoming more and more prominent in that. Um, and in, in addition to that, though, uh, final question here. Every it's funny you mentioned that on AI because everybody I talk to always, particularly in compliance, are still looking for AI within technology to help them with the day to day activities of things. So uh, I'm curious, you know, you have a wide array and in, in being around the world, dealing with different compliance issues at all kinds of different organizations. What tech do you see out there today? What, what exists that could help companies manage these new guidances coming from the DOJ updates and just to enhance their compliance programs in general? What are some things you're seeing? Well, Justin, I mean, to me, the very foundation of any compliance program, uh, and, and, and you know this, starts with policies. You know, policies codify compliance. When people will say, you know, what does our compliance program look like, at least on paper, you know, I start, what do your policies say? Your code of conduct, your uh, policies related to bribery and corruption, like gift, entertainment, hospitality, political contributions, uh, your antitrust policies, your HR policies on inclusivity, diversity, harassment, discrimination. Uh, you know, all this starts with policies. And as we enter this new era of ESG, and, and that's a whole nother area of compliance we haven't talked about, uh, and, and all the greenwashing lawsuits, as well as the regulations and, and so forth. Uh, I mean, ESG starts with policies. I mean, that, that's all codified in, in policies. Compliance, ethics, and ESG, and of course, there's overlap between all these, they're all codified in policies. And, and so the first thing is to understand what policies you have. And a lot of organizations don't even know that. I, I keynoted at a conference several years back, and I asked the 200 people in the audience, I said, who here has a master list of all your policies? That, that at the Department of Justice, uh, other law enforcement, the regulator, external auditors, uh, um, opposing counsel in a civil suit, they want to see your policies, who could produce it? Two people out of 200 raised their hand that they had a master index of all their policies. One large bank that we both worked with, you know, they came to my policy management by design workshop. You know, they said, we got to figure out what policies we have. And they discovered, they, they spent the whole summer finding 5,000 policies across North America, another 5,000 policies, the rest of the world. You know, a, a, a healthcare organization in the U.S. came to me and said, we have 18,000 policy and procedure documents because we've acquired 20 some hospitals over 20 some years. And they each came in a completely redundant set of policies. I mean, policy starts and gets code. I mean, compliance starts and gets codified in policies. So you inventory your policies. The next thing is, are we following our policies? Your policies can be smoke and mirrors. I mean, I got a code of conduct here on my laptop that back in the year 2000, it was the model code of conduct and other organizations were copying for theirs. And that's Enron's code of conduct. You know, so you can have great policies, but are they a reality is the next question. But compliance gets codified in policies, and then it's up to those policies to be followed and engaged to employees in the organization and monitored. Well, uh, agreed <laughs> on all those fronts. I can't tell anybody here how many conversations I've had with organizations, and we're talking with them about uh, our solution, Clause Match. And how they <laughs> say, well, I can't find this policy, um, and I'm I'm looking for it, and I don't know where it is. Uh, so it definitely starts with, particularly if you're a, a, a multinational organization, you get into all kinds of different organizations, or if you're acquiring organizations and you have to um, uh, look at policies that might be similar, and which one becomes the master, which one becomes the the child policy. How do you do that? Um, doing that all very manually becomes uh, a very a very big pain um, for everybody involved. So having all that codified and starting there, and then also so many organizations will say, "Yeah, we really need a policy around this," but I don't. I I just want somebody to tell me what it is. 
I don't want to have to start it from scratch. So you go to some organizations that provide those types of policies. And then the regulator comes in and they say, well, um, yeah, that, that's great that you have this, but this isn't really tailored to your organization. Where's this? Where's that? Um, as well. And it's not just compliance and legal and ethics as well, uh, you know, IT around data privacy. And you, you were mentioning CISOs as well. Um, we speak to a lot of CISOs and, you know, they need to have policies and that gets touched by a bunch of different people in the organization. So having, um, you know, some tech or some some platforms that help manage those are are really important from what we're hearing from a lot of the organizations we're talking to. So, um, Michael, thanks for for sharing all that information um, with us and, and with the, uh, the people watching here today, one, one of the major things that you, you mentioned, and just something I wanted to share now with, um, uh, those that, those of you that are watching, obviously, uh, we at Clause Match here have a platform that helps with that. But a big thing that Michael has been talking about is one thing that has been a recurring theme, policies, procedures, having an audit trail, things of that nature. It's very important to maintain that and have that kind of central repository, where you have all these policy procedures where people can go and find them. Um, that's one of the first steps of the compliance program journey. So what I want to just do for a quick few moments was just share what we do in clause match around the audit trail and giving you that kind of central repository to handle some of the things that, that Michael has been mentioning here. So I'm going to uh, briefly show you what that can look like for your organization. Again, um, <laughs> it can be us. It can be another organization, um, another platform. Um, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, lot wonderful GRC platforms out there as well that do a multitude of other things. But it's important to just have something that shows you and gives you that aspect of, of, of an audit trail, so you can, you know, document what has gone on through your policies. How are policies connected? Um, who's done what, when, and where? Um, because it's directly related to some of this DOG guidance that's come out. So what I'm just showing you for just a couple of minutes, I'm just going to highlight the one aspect of the audit trail. But this is our, our document editor, because um, I'm sure most of you will probably are using Word to write policies and procedures and things like that. Um, so we have a, a document editor that does the exact same, has this exact same look and feel, but with all the bells and whistles that Word doesn't really give you. Um, you know, you don't have to, uh, like many people tell me, write all of your changes in a document at the bottom of a Word doc and then save that as version two and then get everybody else's changes through an email thread and then have to document all of those in one master file with everybody's changes over time and then send that to the board that they review and approve. Um, you can make it a lot simpler and a lot, a lot easier. Um, and so what I've got here is just a standard policy around sanctioning. Um, you can see the document here. And there are, in, in clause match, we have two different ways of doing an audit trail, which is interesting and unique. One is being able to have the full document level um, uh, activity that's happened over time. So as I scroll down, you can see everything that's been going on in this document. This is a document that's in draft mode. We're working on approving the next version. And you can see as I scroll down, it's telling me who's done what, what day it was. Um, you know, conversations that have occurred on certain certain items, a full running list of everything that's occurred as it's happening um, in real time. You can see what uh, approvals are pending as well at the paragraph level. Um, so there's the full document activity, you, can, you know, filtering down what you want to look for. I want to look for document approvals by a particular user between a certain day and time. This just makes it so much easier to go find the information you're looking for. Um, to go and prove if a regular an auditor comes in and says, hey, show me what happened on such and such day. Why did this, you know, why did you make this change based on the regulation change or the DOJ update? You can show that. But also there's a uh, paragraph level activity. So there's the full document and then there's also the paragraph. And you can see what's gone on just in this paragraph alone. Who's done what? Who edited it? What are the, you know, what time? What was the change that occurred? And you can see everything that's happened there. And again, scrolling down, you see everything that's listed within the document. So, and this is this is fully exportable as well. So you might say, well, that's all well and great. Uh, I have that, but I still need to show things to um, to the auditors or the or the regulars when they ask for it. So, you know, there's also the way, ability to export that audit report. So again, no longer having to just put everything at the end of a Word document, 
but actually having everything in real time um, show up in the document, having everything listed here, all the information on the document, who's been involved, what are the comments that have happened, what are the approvals that have occurred, um, all this listed right at your fingertips, right uh, due to technology getting involved again, whether it's it's uh, it's clause match or not. And then being able to see the the history over time, right? Different versions, what has happened over time and how do I compare that to the audit trail? Here's a different version that I'm comparing what I'm working on now to another version, version 1.7. Here's all the red lines and things, right? These are all the things you would have to do in Word anyway, right? But you have to do a side by com comparison. So trying to, you know, utilizing tech to make your lives a little bit easier in this way seeing what's gone on and then referencing it here um, in the audit trail uh, makes it very easy for you to find that information you're looking for. And then what is the finished uh, product? We were talking a lot about having a, a policy for um, uh, dealing with external communication, You know, having a centralized repository here. Um, so we have our uh, devices teleworking policy, having a written out final version that everybody can access seeing what prior versions there might be from before, being able to export it out, and then having your, um, your portal here, as uh, Michael was mentioning, to have all of your documents listed, being able to find the documents in, in your organization to be able to, to access them, do attestations, and make sure people are up to date uh, with their information. So just wanted to share a little bit about what the world could look like for you. Um, this is how we do it. There are a multitude of different ways of, of doing, doing that. Lots of other great uh, technology out there that can help with that. Um, and it's something important to consider while these DOJ updates have come out and what you're considering and how you want to improve your compliance programs and what are the best things. Um, we think we have it pretty good over here at Clause Match, And obviously we have a lot of clients in the space that are utilizing it and finding value of it. But um, considering tech to deal with it um, is is something to consider with these these new updates coming out. So that um, that's all from me. Uh, what I want to do now is send it back over to Emma. I think we have some questions that have come out. So um, you know, hopefully, uh, Michael can add some more expertise based on what the questions were. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Thank you for the walkthrough for, uh, of Clause Match and showing us sort of the audit trial process. So we have had a question come in. Um, and Michael, this one will be for you. So how does an organization's commitment to ethical values and principles influence the development, implementation, and effectiveness of its compliance program? There was a lot there. Can you, can you read that once more? <laughs> yeah, of course. So how does an organization's commitment to ethical values and principles influence the development, implementation, and effectiveness of their whole compliance program. To me, that's where it starts. Uh, and and uh, it starts with what are ethical uh, values, principles, and how these get mapped to objectives of the organization, as opposed to a bottom-up checklist. I mean, a good, strong compliance program isn't driven by requirements, it's driven by its ethical values and principles. Requirements are still important, but you know, part of those ethical values is you know, compliance to the law. Um, the, the, that could be a, a very strong ethical value. But like, like as I mentioned in, in Europe with principles or outcome-based re re regulation, it's getting to those values, the principles, the outcomes, the objectives, instead of managing compliance to a list of requirements, like a checklist, we're managing compliance to those values, which drives the program. And the same thing with ESG. I mean, organizations that are building ESG programs based on risk are putting the cart before the horse. ESG starts with objectives. We have an objective to be carbon neutral. Uh, we don't have risk to be, well, there are risks to be carbon neutral, but we have to have the objective first. You know, we have an objective to be carbon neutral. Uh, same thing with the compliance program. We have objectives on in different areas of in inclusivity and diversity and uh, fraud, bribery, corruption, and modern slavery and all these different areas. Uh, you know, we have objectives in each of those areas, and, and we, we define what our objectives, what our values, what our principles are, and we manage our compliance program while taking in consideration of our requirements, we manage our compliance program to those objectives. 
Great, thank you. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, the person that and sent that in. So we are just going to wrap up to uh today's session. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Michael and Justin, um, also for joining us today. Just a reminder to everyone: the recording will be shared with you tomorrow afternoon, so you can watch it again on demand and share it with any of your colleagues. Um, if you would like to know more about Clause Match, please feel free to reach out to us or Justin directly. And if you have any GRC compliance, I guess any questions at all around the compliance, feel free to reach out to um, Michael as well. So I'd just like to wish you all a great rest of the day and thank you so much again for joining us.